Hi everyone, welcome to worship today. Today as we move from summer into our fall season, we uh, are starting to get back to in-person worship here at Holy Family. And uh, we've moved across the hall to the auditorium. And so while we are feeling out that new space, um, that bigger space that allows us to stay uh, socially distanced um, and yet still gather together, uh, we give thanks uh, for our amazing partnership with Yellowknife United Church uh, in, in what building we, we share um, and um, the generosity that they've uh, offered us to be able to, to be in that space and use some of their equipment and, and all of that kind of thing. And so um, that's what we'll be doing, uh, some of us, uh, this Sunday. Uh, others, uh, you're joining us uh, from here in Yellowknife as members of our congregation or as uh, people across Canada who have just uh, joined us for a time of worship. I'm Pastor Kirk and uh, it, is, it is good to be with you uh, in this way. We are uh, grateful to uh, be able to gather for uh, a quick time of um, prayer and reflection over our gospel from Matthew today and also um, take part in a, a message from uh, Reverend Adam Snook from uh, the Eastern Synod who is assistant to the bishop there. Um, part of our the summer series that the ELCIC has put on uh, for different assistant bishops or bishops or, or staff across um, our amazing uh, national church who have, who have given of their wisdom and their time. And, and so we hear uh, from him today and give thanks uh, for that resource. Next week, we should be back with, uh, with me and, uh, and that will be good as well. Today, we gather uh, in Matthew's gospel as Peter questions Jesus, uh, how many times should one forgive? seven times or more and 70 times seven or something like that is the response um, infinite it's a preposterous number which is kind of Matthew's point Jesus's point and so we think about all of the times uh, in which we need to be forgiven or have uh, forgiven others or failed to forgive others um, or to forgive others rather and so as we gather um, as I'm taping today um, I'm looking across my office at Rembrandt's the picture of uh, the prodigal son and kneeling before uh, his loving father who welcomes him back time and time again uh, we know that this is our God a God of forgiveness, a God of love. And so as we gather for worship this morning, we do so uh, confessing those things on our hearts um, before this God. And we hear God's words of good news to us. We're going to be using uh, the corporate confession and forgiveness from our Evangelical Lutheran worship uh, book. One that we don't often uh, use, but I think is, is good for us this morning. And so blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who forgives all of our sins and whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open and all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so we pray. Holy God, holy mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. 
for self-centered living, and for failing to walk with humility and gentleness. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. For longing to have what is not ours, and for hearts that are not at rest with ourselves. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. For misuse of human relationships, and for unwillingness to see the image of God in others. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. For jealousies that divide families and nations, and for rivalries that create strife and warfare. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. For reluctance in sharing the gifts of God, for carelessness of the fruits of creation. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. For hurtful words that condemn, for angry deeds that harm, holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. For idleness in witnessing to Jesus Christ, and for squandering the gifts of love and grace. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. The good news, my friend, is that we worship a God who is rich in mercy and loves us even when we were dead in our sin and makes us alive together with Christ. By grace we have been saved. And in the name of Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. May our God Almighty strengthen us with power through the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in our hearts through faith.
Would you pray with me? O Lord God, merciful one, you are the inexhaustible fountain of forgiveness. And so replace our hearts of stone with hearts that love and adore you, that we may delight in doing your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, we pray. Amen. A reading from Matthew's Gospel, the 18th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Then Peter came and said to Jesus, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? But Jesus said to him, Not seven times, but I tell you, Seventy-seven times. For this reason, Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. And when he began the reckoning, the one who owed him ten thousand talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold together with his wife and his children, and all of his possessions, and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him of the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused, and he went and he threw, himself in, threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. And when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed. And they went and they reported to their Lord all that had taken place. And then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all of that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace to you and peace. My name is Pastor Adam Snook and I serve as an assistant to the bishop in the Eastern Synod of our ELCIC. I consider it a great honor to be welcomed into someone's home and I am just as honored to gather with you, however and wherever you are worshiping this day. I've always enjoyed reading from whimsical storybooks about the little engine who could or saying goodnight to the moon as a child to poring over great Canadian fiction or the classics on a Saturday afternoon in the summer. Reading is one of my favorite hobbies. As a teenager, I became quite attracted to those choose your own adventure books. You may recall them. Essentially, and if you're not familiar at any given point in the book, you would be presented with a choice to make. Should you open the rattling door? If so, keep reading, but if not, skip to page 71. Or would you like to climb the mountain in search of the legendary lost treasure? If so, keep reading. If not, skip to the final chapter, that sort of thing. You get the idea. I so enjoyed the suspense of these books. 
I appreciated their creativity, but perhaps most of all, I valued the fact that if you didn't like the ending, you could simply go back to the beginning, make a few altered choices and craft something completely different, something a bit more appealing. In this morning's gospel reading from Matthew, the story of the unforgiving servant, we encounter a parable about a king who wished to settle his debts. The story begins with the king demanding repayment from a servant for the outstanding balance of 10,000 talents. It's an absurd amount of money. One talent alone was the same as 130 pounds of silver and would have taken a servant 15 years to earn, which means that 10,000 talents was equivalent to 150,000 years of labor. It's incomprehensible. So unbelievable, in fact, that early Greek manuscripts would often reduce the number to make it a bit more palatable. But I think that the absurdity is critical to the story. It would have been impossible for a servant to repay such a debt. We, we know that. So and with no real other choice, the indebted servant pleads for forgiveness. And the king, who was excessive in severity, also chooses to be excessive in mercy. He forgives the debt, forgives the loan, and forgives the servant. But this is where things get complicated. Because it seems that such excessive mercy is lost on the servant. In turn, he quickly denied forgiveness to someone who owed him a far smaller, far less significant amount of money, only about a day's wage. It's a cringe-worthy turn of events that leaves the reader shocked and confused. The parable closes ominously with the unforgiving servant being handed over for punishment and a stern warning for those who follow after. Needless to say that when the parable of the unforgiving servant rolls around in the lectionary cycle, I find myself wishing that I was back in junior high school, wishing that I was reading one of those choose-your-own-adventure books and somewhat able to alter the outcome. Because I don't like this one. I want the servant to be so moved with gratitude that he cannot help but to live a new life. I want him to be so moved with gratitude that he cannot help but to, to skip through the streets in joyful praise. I want him to proclaim forgiveness and to proclaim mercy and to proclaim love from the very rooftops that nearly came crashing down to everyone and for everything. I want the outcome to be different. Sounds good, doesn't it? But you and I both know that forgiveness isn't always easy. And that's why I believe this parable is so important. Because in as much as I might wish to identify with the king in Jesus' parable, the truth of the matter is that most days, I'm sitting down right next to the servant with the absurd amount of debt. The one who can't dig themselves out, who needs forgiveness the one who messes up, and the one who struggles to forgive others in return. Sound familiar? And so let me ask you a question. What if, what if instead of trying to shy away from the depth of this passage, what if instead of trying to rewrite or avoid its weight, we alternatively choose to lean into it, to embrace it? Embrace the truth that we can't do it on our own. Embrace the truth that forgiveness is more than just some nicety or kind platitude. Embrace the truth that we are going to mess up. Embrace the truth that for most of us, forgiveness is a struggle, a challenge. Because then it occurs to me that when we do so, when we lean into all of our worries and fears surrounding this portion of Scripture, what we will quickly discover is that forgiveness is not primarily God's expectation. 
but rather that forgiveness is first and is foremost God's gift. And that even when forgiveness may seem impossible, such forgiveness is possible for God. And that, dear friends, is good news. Because God's unbelievable, nearly inconceivable, amazing, absurd, and utterly astounding forgiveness changes everything. And that gives me hope. And I pray that it may inspire you also. You know, about the same time I was reading those Choose Your Own Adventure books, I also started working at Lutheran Camp Mushamush in Nova Scotia. And I remember sitting in the chapel early one morning as the visiting pastor spoke about forgiveness. And truth be told, and while caring for a cabin of eight-year-old boys who were more concerned with throwing rocks at one another than they were with listening to the pastor, shocking, I know, I really didn't hear much of what she said, but I do recall her yelling at the top of her lungs so loudly that it echoed across the lake with crisp clarity the words, you are forgiven. I mean, she belted it out. But even more memorable than her words was the feeling I felt after hearing it. In that moment, I felt unencumbered and hopeful. In that moment, everything seemed possible. Siblings in Christ, God's beloved, hear these words when I repeat them to you. Words that I pray you have heard time and time again throughout your lives. You are loved. You are forgiven. God's grace has set you free. Let the echoes of these words reach into the very core of your being. Let their resounding cadence seep into each and into every aspect of your lives. And may God's astounding forgiveness awaken us to the hope and to the life that such a grace makes possible. Thanks be to God. Amen. Receive a blessing for the day. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine on you and be gracious to you. May God look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of God, who is our Father and our Mother, and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve our God. Thanks be to God.